We have to build the future we want. We can reduce pollution. We can bring energy access to billions of people who don't have it. We're trying to reach for something that you can't get to without taking risk. There's going to have to be some more aggressive effort, either regulatory or funding. This is the greatest market opportunity that's going to present itself, and that's the transformation of energy. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. I want to welcome our audience uh, to this uh, webinar for the uh, Catalyst series, uh, which is a focus today on carbon removal strategies. I'm Harry Atwater, uh, Division Chair for Engineering and Applied Science at Caltech. And we this webinar is presented as a collaboration between Caltech and Nostera, our partner, uh, and uh, uh, in, in, in the uh, uh, presentation today on carbon removal. So I want to say a little bit about Caltech, and Caltech has uh, had a storied history in the area of sustainability, dating from the early work of chemist Ari Hagen Schmidt, whose pioneering research identified the uh, atmospheric emissions associated with the use of leaded gasoline, and his work uh, as uh, pioneering science work and policy work led to regulatory uh, changes in the use of gasoline and uh, ultimately to the establishment of the California Air Resources Board and much of the environmental policy around uh, air pollution. And the work at Caltech continues under uh, the auspices of the Resnick Sustainability Institute, which is a large-scale research program that whose sustainability research portfolio spans from global climate modeling to uh, electrochemistry and biochemistry approaches to carbon mitigation and uh, decarbonization, as well as uh, energy resiliency in our utility infrastructure uh, and uh, the policy questions associated with all of those uh, things. Uh, and I'll just note that in uh, 2023, the International uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate uh, Change issued a report that for the first time called for uh, a, a reduction in the uh, emissions associated with fossil fuels. But in its report this time, in order to uh, achieve the objectives of uh, maintaining a temperature rise uh, uh, at or uh, below uh, 1.5 degrees C, for the first time in its report, it uh, and it, it, it brought to, uh, to bear a new finding, which is that the effort to limit the global temperature rise will require carbon removal. That means removing carbon that has been emitted or is being emitted into the atmosphere from the use of fossil fuels. Today's discussion uh, focuses on the subject of carbon removal. In 2021, the International Energy Agency uh, reported that in order to meet this uh, 1.5 degree temperature rise uh, in global uh, uh, temperatures, there can be no more expansion of fossil fuel extraction. Uh, and that indeed, that goal would require reduction of coal uh, by uh, 2050 by 99%, oil by 70%, and gas 84%. Uh, on the other hand, that is not the trajectory that our, our world's uh, economy is on. So that brings us to the discussion of carbon removal. So carbon removal, just to uh, uh, level the landscape for all the listeners today, refers to removing dilute carbon that has been emitted into the atmosphere or into the biosphere, uh, that meaning the ocean or the uh, land environment, uh, such that uh, this... Uh, enables removal of atmospheric uh, CO2. We will also talk uh, as we get into the discussion about carbon capture and sequestration, which refers to the capture of carbon at the point of fossil fuel combustion, often in an industrial site like a power plant or a cement factory. So uh, another thing that we see approaching is that the remaining uh, carbon budget we have is very limited. By some estimates, that remaining budget 
is no more than 500 gigatons. Some would make that estimate even smaller at 250 gigatons in order to maintain uh, a, uh, a atmospheric uh, 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 atmospheric carbon concentration that would allow us uh, not to exceed the 1.5 C goal. So it's in that context that we begin today's discussion. Uh, and so I want to introduce uh, my collaborator and co-moderator, D- Dave Welch uh, from Nostera, who is our uh, collaborator uh, and who's going to tell us uh, about uh, his work, and then uh, Jess Adkins, who's my co-moderator, who will introduce our panelists. So I'll first uh, turn it over to you, Dave. Uh, thanks, Harry. Appreciate it. Thank you for the kind introduction. Thank you for the wonderful opportunity to partner with Caltech to address a, a critical uh, issue for our society, and that is uh, how do we reduce our carbon and how do we make it happen as fast as possible? Uh, Nestera is a community of entrepreneurs, and we welcome all entrepreneurs to please uh, join us. Uh, in order to help solve these problems and and to be able to, uh, uh, we are out there trying to address a number of questions. Today's question uh, for us is really about energy uh, and the conversion of energy and the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the When we look at the problem, and again, the, the issue is both how to achieve it, but how to achieve it fast. Uh, and in that, we believe that it is the uh, simultaneous simultaneity of low carbon emissions, low cost energy, and abundant energy, that those three things played a role that allow the market to make a rapid transition to clean energy. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, why we believe that's that's the case and raise some questions for the, for the panelists uh, specifically about carbon. And I start my conversation around the data. This is uh, Lawrence Livermore National Labs uh, Sankey diagrams that talk about the energy flows. And uh, we started actually our uh, relationship with uh, Caltech about a year and a half ago at a conference where we spent time talking about how you could rewire this. Well, uh, the world has gone on and realized, hey, we need to start electrifying our, our transportation sector, moving that transportation sector up to the grid. There's a couple of fascinating things that come out in that analysis. Uh, the first is uh, the transportation sector uh, is actually the least efficient uh, of our uh, 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 applications where we take energy and we create work out of them. Uh, in the transportation sector, we have about 5.65 uh, quads of energy uh, that we're trying. Oops, sorry, that we are trying to uh, realize. The efficiency of that transportation sector is 21%, which means 79% of the energy that we put into transportation is just generating heat. Uh, The grid, on the other hand, has an efficiency, uh, current efficiency of about 36% of energy in versus work out from the grid. And uh, that uh, includes that we've displaced about 50% of the coal that we used to burn with natural gas, and we're in that we need to continue those transitions away from coal and ultimately away from natural gas as well. But that 21% and 36% uh, uh, create an, an interesting dynamic. When you move the petroleum market or the transportation application to the grid, you do a number of things. And one of the most critical things for us to realize is that by moving that to the grid, I've moved petroleum into a commoditized marketplace. Uh, The amortization of of petroleum, if you will, you buy kilowatt hours of energy off of that grid, you source it from what whoever can come in and create that energy and compete in that marketplace. Currently, transportation is, is fueled by petroleum, which is dominated by cartel pricing. If we move transportation to that sector, what we find is the equivalent dollar uh, per barrel that you would pay if you were buying that energy off the grid is about $15.30 per barrel. Okay, well, let's think about that for a second. Uh, the current, um, if I look at annualized price per barrel over the past 20 years, what you realize is that price is anything uh, but commoditized. Uh, these ups and downs are reflective of, of uh, geopolitical and cartel-based uh, management of that energy system. 
And the prices are substantially higher than the baseline of $15 per barrel. As a matter of fact, if you look at it in this sector, over the past 20 years, we have at least paid $6 trillion of excess dollars for the right to use petroleum in our car. As we electrify that transportation sector up to the grid, where that marketplace is a commoditizing marketplace across energy sources, we recoup that $6 trillion. And as a result, we simultaneously clean our energy and reduce the cost of our energy. And it's very important that that message goes forward because if you want to drive the economy, that's $6 trillion of new money into the economy to be able to create uh, economic growth that is currently tied up and frankly is in, in the hands where it's costing us more money in the form of defense, et cetera, uh, to counteract uh, uh, that $6 trillion. So also with that electrification is the removal of carbon, transition of carbon. So uh, the transportation sector currently uh, consumes, uh, generates about 1.8 gigatons of excess carbon out of the 4.8 gigatons uh, uh, out there. If I were to move that transportation sector again up to the grid, uh, I get almost this factor of two of the efficiency gain, and I get a reduction, a total reduction of the uh, carbon emissions from that system. And we move from 4.8 gigatons to 3.6 gigatons uh, when including, sorry, uh, when including both the uh, movement to the grid and let the natural gas replace all of the coal uh, in that process as an interim step. Uh, so we can get our 26% uh, carbon reduction savings in those transitions. So now if I break these carbon markets down and I think about it, I'm going to highlight the four that uh, I think are most meaningful. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the grid. We've talked about the transportation sector and the transitions going on in those two areas. But we also have the agricultural sector and we have the industrial uh, sector. So uh, currently, the, we've been going through over the last 10 years this transition from dominated coal supply in the electrical sector to natural gas. And now we need to make that transition on over to clean energy. On the transportation sector, it's all about leaving petroleum behind and uh, uh, energizing our transportation applications via the grid uh, in that process. And so the question to the panel is, if these are my, if I think about this as these are my carbon markets I'm trying to address uh, is, uh, oops, uh, when and where does carbon capture make sense? How can we engage a, a market dynamic that uh, increases the speed of deployment of it? And in what uh, market sector are we most uh, likely to uh, uh, push that forward uh, for us? That's my question to the uh, panel. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up. Uh, uh, again, we encourage entrepreneurs that are interested in solving these, uh, some of these difficult problems, please uh, uh, join Nostera in that. Our belief is that one of the most important things for rapid adoption of our uh, solution set is to move to a single commoditizing uh, market sector for energy. In doing so, you will both uh, lean in to low carbon solutions, realize low cost outcomes, driving the cost of energy down, uh, which will also drive a greater abundance of energy to solve some of our future problems, such as desalination or farming, et cetera. So with that, uh, uh, Harry, again, I thank you for the opportunity to work on this together. I'm going to pass it off to you and Jess to follow on. Great. Yeah, so I'll uh, thank you, Dave, uh, that, uh, for that uh, provocative and uh, it's uh, uh, beginning setting the stage. And I want to just introduce... Uh, my uh, fellow Caltech faculty member, Professor Jess Adkins, uh, Professor of Environmental Science and Engineering, uh, who will introduce our panel. Thank you, Harry. Thank you, David. It is a pleasure to, to be here. Um, I uh, will be introducing our panelists quite briefly. Each of them has sort of about five minutes uh, after I introduce them to tell us a little bit about themselves and their background and, and where they're coming from on this subject. And so we'll spend uh, 20 minutes going through that, and then we'll get into some of the questions of the panel. But 
we encourage them each to to uh, talk for five minutes about where they're coming from. So first, I have the pleasure of introducing Emily Carter from Princeton University, where she is the Anglinger Professor of Energy and the Environment. She is a professor of mechanical and aerospace engineering and a director of their Princeton Plasma, Plasma Physics Lab. So Emily, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Jess. Uh, so uh, just to say a few words about me, I'm not the director of the Princeton Plasma Physics Lab. I'm senior strategic advisor and associate lab director for applied materials and sustainability sciences currently there. Um, that's a DOE national laboratory uh, that Princeton manages. And I come to this conversation having been in sustainable energy technology research for nearly two decades and uh, more recently in carbon mitigation. I was also Princeton's founding director of the Anlinger Center for Energy and the Environment, which is the analog of um, the, the Resnick Institute at Caltech. Um, I was also Dean of Engineering after that, after being the founding director of the Anlinger Center for six years, I was the Dean of Engineering uh, at Princeton and uh, I'm in my current role now building out new programs in sustainability science, um, some of which directly uh, relate to the topic of today. So with that, um, what I wanted to do is to uh, share a few slides uh, that come from another hat that I wear, which is I am chairing for the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine, um, a three-year congressionally mandated study on carbon dioxide utilization. And that, uh, and carbon utilization, actually even more broadly than carbon dioxide, although it's focused heavily on carbon dioxide. And we, when we're talking about carbon removal, we're mostly talking about carbon dioxide removal. So let me share my screen. Um, and I'm just gonna run through a few slides that give a bit of a taste of a report that was issued uh, uh, last December, we're actually in the process of, of um, gathering information and formulating a second deeper dive report. Um, but the first report focused on issues that are quite germane to uh, some of the issues that were just brought up by, by Dave Welch, in fact. The link is, is below. I don't expect you all to, to be able to memorize that, but if you go uh, if you Google these, these names um, in the title, you'll find it very quickly. So um, just quickly, this report was looking at chemical transformations of how one might not just consider carbon dioxide as a waste product to be removed, but actually as a feedstock. And, the, and in particular, not, not just a feedstock with respect to um, uh, um, physical use. In fact, that was not in the scope of the report. So we're not looking at physical uses of CO2, such as in um, carbonated beverages, but in fact, only for chemical transformations where CO2 could come from anywhere in the environment or from a point source from industry. And it has to be that it's being trans, um, that it's being transformed into marketable products. So this was the analysis that um, the committee that I chair uh, has been working on. It's important to note that climate impacts depend when we think about CO2 utilization on the products, on how long the products that one makes will exist in our society. Uh, so product lifetime, also the source of CO2, and as well, when one converts CO2, there, are, there will be other inputs such as clean electricity and possibly clean hydrogen. Um, and so the emissions associated with the production of electricity and, and hydrogen also matter. So as an example, one can imagine, and it is possible to do this, to take CO2 and combine it with minerals and make building products such as concrete or aggregate, where you, you form a solid product that is that both durably stores the CO2 in a different form, but also produces a, a marketable product that has a lifetime of over 100 years. So that is, a, is an exciting possibility for um, for. Uh, carbon removal technologies. On the other hand, it, of course, our society needs all sorts of carbon-based products, and that includes chemicals and fuels. And the problem is that chemicals and fuels eventually degrade back to CO2. So their product lifetime is less than 100 years. And so when one thinks about converting CO2 with clean hydrogen and electricity to those chemicals or fuels, eventually you make CO2 again. So the best you can do in that case is have a circular carbon economy. And that is not conducive with carbon uh, removal, obviously. Okay, 
So what this leads to is an understanding that you have to think about pairing the source of the CO2, and this goes to the question that Dave Welch mentioned, um, that uh, you know, where would we build out uh, carbon, uh, carbon removal? Well, you, you have to think about the source and the product that one might make in addition to thinking about sequestration. And so if you think about, for example, fossil sources of CO2, be they from power plants or, or other, other uh, um, sources of, of CO2 in, in, in industry, for example, th through the burning of fossil fuels, then the only compatible way of using fossil fuels for carbon, uh, for carbon removal is in these long lived products, these solid products that I mentioned before. That gives something which is so-called net zero emissions compatible. You're not, you're not um, emitting any carbon to the atmosphere. So fossil sources, the short lived products, just thinking of the counter argument, all that does is delay emissions. Eventually, those short-lived products will, will become CO2. So that's not sustainable. So as we think about where we put these, these um, conversion or sequestration uh, uh, places, fossil point sources absolutely um, have to go to these long-lived products or be sequestered. On the other hand, uh, if, you if you take carbon dioxide directly from the air, such as direct air capture, or from the ocean in direct ocean capture, or from, for example, ethanol plants, which, which give off um, uh, biogenic sources of CO2, all of those are compatible with either net negative emissions. If you make long-lived products, you're taking CO2 from the atmosphere uh, and you're eventually making uh, uh, um, a, you're making a product that will that will permanently store durably store CO2, or it can be net zero emissions compatible in the fact that you can make you can make short lived products. So fuels and chemicals in particular, those short lived products must come from either direct air capture, direct ocean, ocean capture, or biogenic CO2. So it's important to do a full life cycle analysis because of this source dependency on the CO2 as we move to a sustainable civilization. So the other point, in addition to thinking about this, this issue about pairing sources with actual products, is how do we build out an infrastructure? How do we fast uh, transition, as Dave Welsh was mentioning, not just in terms of energy, but in terms of getting carbon out of the atmosphere and either storing it or utilizing it? Well. What the committee came to is a, rec is a recognition that one really should be thinking about strategic co-location, where uh, essentially where the products are going to be used. For example, in an urban area, one would think about um, making building materials from, for example, uh, um, uh, emissions from a power plant and then uh, converting it to uh, cement that wouldn't have to be co concrete, that would not have to be transmitted, uh, tra trans, uh, 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 transported very far. The other uh, idea too would be, for example, you could imagine having, there's some chemical manufacturing plant that, that already exists that has energy inputs and water and hydrogen available to it. And then you could imagine pairing that with a direct air capture facility that could allow you to have the circular economy piece of it. This would get rid of having to build out um, as extensive a CO2 transportation infrastructure and would maximize climate benefits. Another way, a broader way of thinking about that same issue of co-location is, is considering building out industrial clusters, thinking about how the, the industrial clusters would not only have the opportunity to utilize CO2 in some of these products we've talked about, but would also at the same time offer the, the possibility of sequestering, of geological sequestration in carbon capture and sequestration. And this would be a way, again, of minimizing the kinds of pipeline networks um, that one might uh, otherwise have to build out. And one would wanna build these out in such a way that they were plug and play, that you, as we build out new CO2 um, utilization technologies, that we could just um, insert those into these clusters uh, through this kind of co-location. And we recognize that there's already a knowledge workforce in, uh, in places that have a large industrial presence. So you would be maintaining jobs that might otherwise go away um, in, a, in a world where we stop using fossil fuels. So finally, in terms of near-term opportunities for investment, uh, we 
we the committee recommended two obvious areas. One is um, that we we've, we've really already discussed, which has to do with building products, taking CO2 actually from any source and combining it with minerals. Uh, that, that's already at a very high technology readiness level, and it provides true carbon removal. The other it doesn't provide carbon removal and is less germane to our conversation, but it is still the case that for heavy duty transformation, both in the marine sector and in aviation, we are very much likely to continue needing those aviation fuels. And we believe that, that low hanging fruit is associated with taking the biogenic CO2 that comes, for example, from ethanol plants, um, corn-based ethanol plants, and combining it with clean hydrogen and electricity to make sustainable aviation fuels, which gives us at least a circular net zero um, economy. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much, Emily. Uh, that's terrific. I really appreciate uh, your comments there, and you touched on a number of things we're going to get into with the panel. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Dan Schrag from Harvard University. Um, Dan is the Sturgis Hooper Professor of Geology. He is a professor of environmental science and engineering. He is the director and founder of the Harvard University Center for the Environment. Um, and he is the director of the Science, Technology, and Public, Public Policy Program at the Harvard Kennedy School. And so Dan really uh, spans the science side and, and the policy side. And Dan, we're looking forward to having you here. Happy to hear from you for a few minutes. Thanks. Thanks, Jess. And thanks, Harry. Um, <clears throat> So I've worked on this problem of uh, overall decarbonization of our energy system and uh, specifically carbon capture and also carbon removal for a very long time. Um, and uh, I have a slightly different view than Emily just expressed. Um, uh, I actually think carbon utilization is kind of a red herring. I think none of the uses of carbon dioxide um, come close to the scale of the problem that we're dealing with. Um, even you know, global cement and only a tiny fraction uh, of that cement could be replaced with carbon um, is only about 4 billion tons, whereas we're producing close to 40 billion tons of CO2 every year from burning fossil fuels. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a different scale of a problem. Um, and I think um, when we think about capture of CO2, um, ultimately from the air, I think integrating it with our energy system as much as possible makes sense. Um, my suspicion is at scale, the most efficient way to um, remove carbon from the air at the lowest cost is probably in connection with the production of biofuels because plants already take carbon out of the air. Um, we are beginning to see that now with the incentives in the US for sequestration, where a number of ethanol refineries in the Midwest are talking about injecting their CO2 underground. And uh, in theory, that could drive their total life cycle emissions negative, meaning that overall, those particular eth ethanol plants would have negative cumulative CO2 emissions. Um, it depends on the plant, it depends on some of the details of how they do their process. But I think if you could imagine uh, a system where we get our jet fuel or our some of our um, uh, liquid fuels for other uses from biomass around the world, um, no question that adding sequestration to that biomass conversion because when you convert biomass to hydrocarbons, you're always going to produce CO2. You're reducing the the biomass to hydrocarbons, and you always end up with carbon dioxide as a byproduct. And that's carbon dioxide to store that is a relatively inexpensive way of actually achieving negative emissions. Now, as far as the, all the other ways that people are talking about doing it, and I've worked on some of these too, I, I, I've come to the opinion over time that, that um, using uh, the ocean is probably going to be the cheapest way to go. That um, not necessarily the carbon in the ocean, although the ocean and atmosphere interact rapidly enough that it doesn't matter that much if it's all in the surface ocean, but um, that I suspect that the most inexpensive ways to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere is to use 
the um, the ocean as our giant carbon collector. The capacity of the ocean is enormous. If we waited a thousand or two thousand years, it would take up eighty percent of the CO two we've put into the air from burning fossil fuels. And so, um, in this way, the solution to pollution really is dilution, and uh, that is an option that we can that we can manage. Um, I think also building a very expensive um, uh, scrubber for the atmosphere, as opposed to some of the proposals for putting alkalinity in the ocean or various other ideas, I think is going to are going to prove a lot more expensive. What is it all going to cost? I think it's early still, but I think it's really hard to imagine that um, the cost of direct air capture overall, separate from using biomass, is going to be a lot lower than a couple hundred bucks a ton. And um, I think when I think about the policy behind it, I think we run into the challenge of the collective action nature of the climate problem. Do we really think at scale, I can totally understand why Microsoft and a number of other companies for claiming carbon neutrality would want to pay for carbon capture at a scale that some people can make some money off of it. But at large scale that actually matters to the climate system at a scale of billions of tons of CO2 a year, um, it's hard to imagine the policy environment where a country would pay several hundred billion dollars um, to remove CO2 from the atmosphere when other countries, whether it's Russia or India or China, um, are still burning coal. That's hard to imagine. And so it requires a particular regulatory regime that we don't have just yet. Europeans are working on something like this, and maybe it'll emerge in the US because some of the energy technology solutions that people are talking about, like green hydrogen, the effective cost on CO2 looks to be extremely expensive for some of those end uses. It may actually be cheaper to continue to burn fossil fuels in some situations like jet fuel and then remove the CO2 from the atmosphere than replacing it with much more expensive fuels, like synthetic fuels. I'll stop there. We can have a conversation about all of that. Dan, I really appreciate uh, your point of view and, and and those words. You've touched on a couple of very important things that are going to come up, touched on price very directly and touched on regulation and the collective action aspect. Also really important themes that we'll keep going here. Okay, Dan, thanks. Um, I'd like to introduce our next panelist is Jennifer Wilcox from the U.S. Department of Energy. And in, in addition to a distinguished academic career, Jennifer is now the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management. I think it got that last part of carbon management added on to fossil energy relatively recently. And Jen, we're really happy that you're here. Uh, and please give us a few minutes of introduction about your point of view. Great. Thanks, Jess. And thanks for having me today. Um, I started uh, in the administration on day one, uh, January 20th, 2021. And Previous to that, I had been a co-author on an Academy of Sciences uh, report, which focused on uh, carbon removal. And really what the report did is it laid out a blueprint for the federal government of how to invest in this space and what would that look like. So it was it was pretty exciting for me to be in the administration at this time. And uh, in the first year, uh, it, that later that year at COP, we launched our first, first uh, Earthshot. And so that earth shot was on carbon negative um, approaches. And we used the Academy of Sciences really as a blueprint for how we might shape the earth shot. And so this is a, an across DOE effort that's our office, fossil energy and carbon management, energy efficiency and renewable energy, which includes some of the biomass feedstocks, um, ARPA-E, and then of course, Office of Science. And so all of us got together, looked at our base appropriations and thought about those investments in a really strategic way and have been investing in this space, not just you know, the chemical approaches to taking CO2 out of the atmosphere, but also thinking about oceans, um, thinking about soils, thinking about improved forest management and really across the entire portfolio of carbon removal, uh, how can we invest in a way such that these approaches are actually durably removing carbon and that they're additional and meaningful. And so a lot of what DOE is investing in is, is the hardware, you know, of making sure that we actually have um, the measurement tools available, uh, rigorous monitoring, reporting, and verification for not just the engineered approaches, but also the nature-based approaches so that we can start to 
um, treat them in a more equal way and maybe have uh, policy incentives in the future, not just for the engineered approaches. So that's been a big uh, part of, of the kickoff at the beginning. And then we passed the bipartisan infrastructure law. And so that was also pretty significant. And so the Department of Energy got $62 billion uh, to invest over five years to build out the first of a kind demonstrations, which are always costly. Uh, and then August uh, last year, the Inflation Reduction Act passed. And so that critical piece of legislation is really all of the tax incentives. You know, it's all of the economic incentives to help build out the nth of a kind uh, on those demonstrations. Um, and so it's really the two pieces of legislation that are really critical for us to being able to scale up that we need to. Uh, I'll just mention briefly too, within fossil energy and carbon management, um, in our work with the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations, uh, which is a new office out of the infrastructure office of DOE. Um, we're working to really look at the $12 billion specifically focused across carbon management. Uh, 3.5 billion of that is to build out four direct air capture hubs, each, uh, each um, having the ability to scale up to a million tons of CO2 removal per year. Uh, in addition, what doesn't get a lot of attention is building out the geologic storage capacity deep underground. And so we have $2.5 billion to build that storage out so that if you are doing direct air capture, there's an offtake. And in uh, that capacity, we're looking at building out 65 million tons of CO2 injection uh, per year by in the early 2030s. And so that's pretty significant. Um, I know we're gonna talk about kind of more conventional carbon capture and storage today outside of carbon removal. And uh, we also have funding to do that. But what I wanted to mention here is that, you know, I, I see CCS as there's a version 1.0 and there's a version 2.0. And I think we're at a stage now where it's not just about CCS on fossil fueled fired power plants. Although when we look at committed emissions, especially for natural gas, we recognize that it's cheaper and easier to avoid the carbon from getting into the atmosphere than having to take it back out with direct air capture. Um, but we're also looking at industry, industries that don't always have to do with fossil fuels. It's more about the process emissions where there's a chemical reaction. Like for instance, when we calcine limestone for cement production, uh, carbon capture is a strategy that can deeply reduce the carbon intensity of cement. And so carbon capture is not just a tool Yes, if we invest in it, it's gonna enable some sectors of, of fossil fuels, absolutely. Um, but it's also just a broader tool than that. And so that's something that we're really working to try and articulate is these various tools. Carbon removal, we don't see it as a tool for energy, we see it as a tool for climate. And the accumulated pool of CO2 in the atmosphere, it's, it's a way that we're going to uh, aid in removing that accumulation. And it's not just using chemicals, but again, it's a broader portfolio and we really need to work on the measurement, the monitoring, the reporting, the verification so that we have durable removals. Um, and so that's just a little bit and I know that I'll get a chance to say a lot more. So thanks for having me. Jennifer, it's ter terrific that you're here and I, I really appreciate your comment about how uh, CO2 is a climate problem, not an energy problem. We talk about it in an energy landscape, but of course we're here because of its effect on the on the climate. And that's first and foremost where uh, where we start thinking. So really appreciate your comments. We'll, we'll get back to you in, in just a little bit. I'd like to introduce our last panelist. That is Julio Friedman. Um, Julio is the non-resident fellow at the Center on Global uh, Energy Policy at Columbia University in the School of International and Public Affairs. Um, he is uh, the chief scientist at Carbon Direct and the CEO of Carbon Wrangler, um, uh, fitting with his bolo tie that he has on, uh, on right here. Really, it's very nice to see you. We really appreciate you uh, joining the, the panel and uh, look forward to your few minutes of uh, introduction about where you're coming from. Thank you, Jess. And it is a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. And thank you, Caltech, for organizing this. Um, I have been in working on climate for 30 years. I've been working on carbon capture for 21 years, been working on carbon removal for 13 years. So nice to see these kinds of events coming together. Over that time, I have been in academia at Columbia University. I have been in government at the national laboratories of the Department of Energy, and of course, in private industry, where I'm now at Carbon Direct. Uh, given that, I want to share a broad perspective about where we're at today and where we need to go. 
promise it'll come in under three minutes. I'm keen to have more discussion, not less. The central point here is for me is that it's not either or, it's yes and. We're all in improv comedy now. It's all yes and. Yeah, we got to do this and we got to do something else. Uh, and that is driving a lot of the investment and policy decisions. In that context, uh, carbon capture from a point source and carbon removal from the air and oceans are two of the many things that are needed. Uh, I actually just wrote a blog on this. If folks in the audience want to take a look, go to LinkedIn. You can see my new blog there. Uh, and put it in the context of uh, Jim Hansen's new article uh, saying that it looks like we're going to blow through our carbon budget in 1.5 this decade. Uh, whether we do it in 2027, 2031, or 2035, it's still bad. We have lots of work to do, so let's get on with it. There's there's an awful lot to consider. In that context, reductions are one thing and removals are another. Uh, a lot of what uh, Dave Welsh was talking about at the beginning are really reductions of emissions. They're not removals of emissions. CO2 capture from a point source is reduction of emissions. Pulling CO2 out of the air and oceans is something different. You know, we have to think about these things as discrete things. Uh, point source capture should be deployed, like Dr. Wilcox said, uh, basically where you get speed and cost benefits. If it's a lot cheaper to do it that way, if you can act a lot faster, that's a good reason to do it. And things like heavy industry are a good case for that, for steel, for cement, for chemicals. Often this is the fastest and cheapest way to decarbonize quickly. Um, for a CO2 removal, it's a different story. Um, this is not a product, it's a service. Uh, and it is it is not a thing you sell, it's a thing you do. Um, it, it can have many, many pathways from trees, from soils, from biomass, like Dr. Schrag was saying, from CO2 mineralization with rocks to direct air capture, all of those are pathways for CO2 removal. And the primary reason to do it is because the math requires it. Already the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is pretty clear about this. We have already overshot. We have to pull something on the order of 1.6 billion tons of CO2 out of the air and oceans before 2030 to get on a one and a half degree trajectory. That's like a third the size of the oil and gas industry. It is a huge undertaking. And we just need uh, to fire on all cylinders. It's going to be super hard to do. If we need to get five to 10 gigatons going by the mid-century, by 2050 or 2070, it doesn't matter. We got a lot to do either way. And we do it because that's how you balance the carbon books. Net zero is the appropriate scientific framework. It means if you emit anywhere, you must unemit the same amount. That's what CO2 removal is for. Because it's a service and not a product, it's more like trash removal than selling widgets. Um, in that context, the voluntary carbon market is trying its best to do these things. But the fundamental thing you need to understand is that you're selling a service. And so the best like value of a carbon certificate that you buy is its retirement. Nobody buys and trades trash removal credits. Like they just don't do it. And the reason why is because it's a service, you do it, and then you're done. And so we're going to see a lot of retirements as the primary vehicle here. There's not going to be a lot of arbitrage in the carbon markets. There's just going to be a lot of retirements. Um, I do not know a single CEO. I do not know a single politician. I do not know a single customer who wakes up in the morning and thinks, hmm, what's the thermodynamic and economic optimum? That's what I should do. Like, that's not the world we actually live in. And as evidence for that, right now, the state of California is paying $7,000 a ton for abatement with electric vehicles. We're providing bonkers, huge incentives to that. And there's good reasons why we want to do that. We want an electric vehicle industry. You get health benefits, all these other things. But we do that because... Arbitrarily, we say we want that done. People want to sell it. People want to buy it. People want to do it. So we're doing electric vehicles. That's the kind of mental framework we're going to have to get into for carbon management. We do it because it's the thing to do and because we want to get more people interested in wanting it. A lot of the market aligning policies we've seen in the last couple of years, including the bipartisan infrastructure law, the CHIPS Act, the annual appropriations, and of course, the Inflation Reduction Act provide a lot of that market aligning policy so now people can make money doing this. I do think about the thermodynamic optimum. In point of fact, I wake up in the mornings and try to figure out how to save money and how to save energy. This was written up years ago at Columbia, a levelized cost of carbon abatement methodology. If you want to get into it, that's helpful to think about decision making. But fundamentally on climate, we have to do all of all of the above. 
We have to do all of all of the above. All of the climate solutions we're looking at are 5% solutions. They tackle 5% of the problem. Buildings are 5%. Cars are 5%. Cement is 6%. Like these are all 5% solutions. So we're going to have to deploy a lot of that. And in doing that, I would encourage the audience to not think about what we should do, but rather to think about what we can do. The hypothetical ideal distracts you from what is possible today. And there's a lot of really, really good work to do today. There's a lot of good investment to be done today. There's a lot of good science to be done today. So think about what we can do, put it through the screen of what's good science and what's good business, and then let's get on with it. Thank you very much, Julio. Uh, really appreciate uh, those comments. And uh, uh, it's great to have all four of you guys uh, kick us off with your individ individual contributions. I'd invite you all to come back on screen um, so that we can have uh, a more of a back and forth discussion amongst the panelists. It's uh, already happening, and it actually, it seems like in the in our in our comments here, which is terrific. And Harry, I'll turn it over to you uh, to start us off with uh, questioning our panelists and getting them going. First of all, I want to say this has been an absolutely uh, a great and concise framework that our panelists have uh, established. Uh, and uh, starting with uh, Dave, who um, really noted that energy and infrastructure has to be viewed as a commodity to enable economically viable and scalable approaches. And uh, Emily Carter, who noted that there are uh, essentially two uh, sort of modes of uh, carbon removal. There's uh, essentially postponement through carbon capture uh, and storage and uh, carbon dioxide removal, uh, and that the permanency of storage needs to be matched uh, to the need in order to uh, yield uh, a net negative uh, a reduction um, uh, and a net, somewhere between net zero and net negative. And she also emphasized the importance of the co-location of infrastructure in order to make a scalable uh, uh, technology for carbon dioxide removal possible. Uh, and Dan Schrag uh, noted that a key challenge is scale and cost, and uh, you, th those are the things that matter. Uh, his perspective was that biomass looks like a, a first practical feedstock uh, and that CDR really has to get to low cost. Uh, many people view a uh, sort of tipping point being somewhere around $100 a ton. And he was thinking that uh, aside from biomass, perhaps uh, there aren't other options that are in that range yet. Uh, and I guess a key question for biomass that hopefully people will touch on is whether the resource availability, uh, the sheer qual quantity of biomass is uh, large enough to, to be scalable to the problem. Uh, and uh, Jennifer Wilcox uh, really uh, gave us a nice uh, view of the initiatives that have gone on since she began her uh, service in the administration, which have been truly transformative uh, and have resulted in uh, carbon removal being a, sig a significant part of our uh, technology and policy landscape. And really uh, that carbon removal is not a fundamentally an energy initiative, but a climate initiative. And that uh, and and uh, Julio Friedman, uh, you know, is, is, is a, began with a, uh, uh, a, a advice that this is a question of all of the above, and we need to do this and that and the other thing, uh, and that uh, uh, fundamentally agreeing that carbon dioxide removal is not an energy initiative, but more like an insurance policy for a future quality of life. So. We've begun to answer this question, but I want to start with sort of a provocative question, which is more or less the existential question for this field, which is why should we even do carbon capture if we have thermodynamic limits and it's always going to be more expensive in terms of energy and, and, and actual uh, uh, invested capital and uh, expenditure to capture carbon once it's been emitted in a dilute and, and is, exists in a dilute form than it is uh, to uh, abate the emissions to begin with. Uh, so you could, if you view this as an entire landscape that couples decarbonization to sustainability uh, and that carbon capture is a piece of this, why shouldn't we be really thinking about uh, just focusing on the decarbonization? That's the best use of our precious uh, capital uh, investment uh, resources uh, and, and so forth. Uh, what's the What's the response to the existential questions? We have some takers here I see already. <laughs> so uh, I'll start with uh, Julio. Uh, 
Yeah, arithmetic. Arithmetic is the reason why. We have already emitted too much carbon dioxide. We have already overshot the Hansen paper with the CO2 in the pipeline. Yeah, you can quibble about the science, but fundamentally it's kind of there. The IPCC has said we need to do it. Period. It is not an, uh, this is why I said all the things I said. It is not a question of either, either or. If we're going to round the corner on climate, all pies have to grow a lot. We have to do way more renewables. We have to do way more vehicle electrification. We have to do way more housing and industrial that we have to do with nuclear and point source capture and all those things, and also do point source capture and also do CO2 removal. That doesn't mean you don't have priorities. You can prioritize across and within those, but like the arithmetic doesn't pencil out. You have to do it. Okay, and I think that's a really fundamentally important question. And if uh, uh, we all go home after the webinar today, uh, in, in, having learned nothing else, then this will be a fundamentally a, a, an important conclusion. Okay, Dan, uh, your perspective on the existential question. Well, I mean, Julio's right that we have to, that net zero is actually a incorrect understanding of the climate problem. We can't just get to net zero. We have to actually remove the CO2 we put in historically. What the climate system cares about is cumulative global emissions. And we've already probably put in enough to, for example, melt the entire Greenland ice sheet if we didn't do something about it. And so that's problematic. Um, but your question, Harry, is, is a little more specific. Why should I focus my limited attention, energy, dollars, et cetera, who goes right? We need to do everything, but we don't have we don't have all the money in the world, and we don't have all the energy in the world, the, the the effort in the world to to put behind this. So why are we starting on this? Why what's the why don't we focus more of our attention on other things? And I think the answer is there are some parts of our energy system that are going to be really difficult to decarbonize, um, uh, and you could think of lots of different examples. Um, uh, I'll be curious to hear what Emily says about the costs of synthetic fuels, for example, for combining CO2 and green hydrogen, for example. But I, you know, it looks to me to be over a thousand dollars a barrel, um, very expensive. And uh, uh, for example, even th simple things like natural gas to heat our homes up here in cold New England, not where you are in Pasadena. Um, but you know, we actually have cold winters, and we have to stay warm. And if we were to say substitute green hydrogen for that natural gas, by our estimates, it would be over a thousand dollars a ton of CO2 equivalent that we'd be abating. And therefore it would be a lot cheaper to use the natural gas and pull the CO2 back out of the atmosphere if we could really do it for two or $300 a ton. It would actually be more efficient to do it that way. So we have to explore it. You know, I think it's gonna be a long time before this is done commercially at large scale. I think there'll be, some commercial entities that will do it at small scale for niche applications and niche uh, buyers, but but it's the learning that we're doing right now. And you know something Julio said earlier is also really important. Um, but I, I want to just adjust what he said just a little bit. He, he's absolutely right. Today, in various policies, we pay obscene amounts per ton of CO2 for certain things. There's all sorts of subsidies in the IRA that if you actually cost it per ton of CO2, comes to thousands of dollars. But I think it's really important to distinguish government subsidies for something that we hope will buy down the cost and ultimately become disruptive. That is, ultimately become cheap enough that it doesn't need that subsidy versus things that will always be this expensive, where we may be subsidizing it today, but it's not necessarily gonna get any cheaper. Yeah. And I think we have to, it's hard to predict the future. We should be humble about the future, but I fear that direct air capture of CO2 through, you know, chemical and mechanical means large, large factories. Um, I, I fear there's limited runway for cost reduction, but I, I would love to be wrong about that. Yeah. Well, I guess in order to uh, have the opportunity to prove you wrong, uh, then we have to start, if ever get to get to a prospect of a large scale, we have to start doing it at the small scale and that's at least part of the answer, yeah. Okay, so Emily, uh, your take on the existential question. Well, I, you know, I agree with with what Julio said. It's it's a it's a 
you know, we have to do it because of the sins of the past. I mean, we, even if we fully decarbonized as much of our society as, as we could right now, the, the accumulated emissions force us to do it. So that's point number one. But I think the other point you were bringing up was that, you know, why don't we just focus on de decar decarbonization? And, and by decarbonization, I can't stand that term, actually, because, of course, we're all made from carbon and, and every, we use carbon in, in everything. So defossilization, let's say that. Um, the fact is that I do think that it makes the most sense that whenever we can avoid emissions by having by moving to clean electricity and using electricity wherever we can so that we're not emitting CO2, um, we should be doing that before we do anything with CO2, whether it's store it or use it. Okay. So, and, you know, Dan, I agree with you. I didn't, I had only five minutes to talk. Okay. So I didn't have time to, to get into nuances, but I don't agree that it's a red herring about carbon utilization because it is the case that there will be you, there, and we will have to look at the differences between using CO2, biomass, and recycled carbon that is not CO2. So recycled plastics, et cetera. So we will need carbon. Question is, where does the carbon come from for various kinds of chemicals, foods, fuels? building materials, et cetera. We will, we will need it. And it's not clear. I mean, you know, uh, whether or not biomass is going to be able to build out the kind of infrastructure. And if, as Carrie said, if there's enough um, biomass to actually uh, provide what's needed. I agree with your numbers, okay? In fact, our, our study said that the likelihood in terms of carbon utilization in terms of how much carbon could actually be used, how much carbon dioxide could be used, it's of the order of, as you said, four gigatons per year, okay, compared to the emissions that are like 40 gigatons per year. So that's why the emphasis is on noting that the chemical industry, the fuels industry, the building industry is whatever it is in terms of what, of, of the uptake of carbon. If, if um, it is the case that it can be proven out to be competitive with whatever feedstocks of carbon there is, it, you know, it, it is a useful way to think about at least piggybacking onto the infrastructure of CCS, right? I think that's extremely important to be thinking that there will be opportunities to do that. And to bring up another issue, which we haven't really touched on, is that as we decarbonize, so first of all, always decarbonize uh, in the in the sense of decarb uh, that, that we've been talking about. So defossilize our energy infrastructure. But we have to think about stranded assets too. That's not something that we've we've mentioned before. And as we do that, as we defossilize our grid, then if we have to factor in, if we build out CCS in places where the eventual asset is no longer producing CO2 or point source, that's a problem too. So it's a big systems design issue and, and a balance that has to be uh, taken into account. But with respect to, I think, I think it was Julio that said, and I completely agree with this, we have to think about this as a service to the world in terms of carbon removal. But at the same time, we have a situation where there can be products that paired with CCS where you're not producing a product, could in fact help the economics. And so I think these are, I liked what Julio said about, you know, it's it's not either or, it's always and. I think we have to be thinking in that way. I'll be quiet. Okay, good. Uh, before I go to Julio, I wanna just uh, ask if Jennifer Wilcox has, wants to jump in on this uh, question as well. Uh, well, I, I don't strongly disagree with anything that's been said. I think the thing I would add is um, you know when you do that bottom-up calculation and looking at the truly hard to decarbonize sectors, and if net zero is what we're trying to achieve, and you do that bottom-up calculation in the United States, we we emit roughly about 5.8 to 6 gigatons of CO2 every year, and the things that are truly hard to decarbonize, like the agricultural sector, in terms of you know N2O or methane emissions. Um, long haul trucking, parts of the aviation sector, these are hard to decarbonize today. And so we're going to need carbon removal in order to really counterbalance the truly hard to decarbonize sectors. The other thing I would say is that 
we rely on the oceans in the terrestrial biosphere to uptake roughly half of our emissions every year, anthropogenic emissions. And we're also seeing that a lot of the forests are becoming sources of emissions. And so the reliability and at the expense of ocean acidification in terms of ocean yeah. uh, too. And so we need to be also just aware um, of the changes in our in those kind of uptakes that we you know that we have and uh, and the other piece I'll just add is if we truly are to have this in our toolkit by mid century at the gigaton scale if we don't invest today we simply won't have it in time so uh, we really do have to invest and see see where we can get and uh, and see how low it can go yeah the first gigaton starts with the first ton. Yep. <laughs> okay, so Julio, back to you for the wrap up on this one. I'll, I'll just be super brief on this. I posted uh, for all the listeners a paper by Holly Jean Buck uh, from a year ago. She actually quantified all the residual emissions in a bunch of countries. That's the stuff we don't know how to get rid of. And in most countries, the number is about 20%. 20% we have no real solutions for. And in each of those, about half of that is industry and agriculture. Those are the most common things. We just got to do the work. Okay, good. All right, I'm going to turn to Jess uh, Atkins, my co-moderator, on the next question. Thanks, Harry, and thank you, everybody. Um, I really appreciate uh, those answers, and 20% uh, is a really interesting number there, Julio, in terms of why are we even talking about this? Why are we not focusing just on uh, decarbonizing the energy sector and ele electrifying everything? There's uh, several sectors that are hard to do. And then there's another piece, which I think we didn't quite touch on, but came up in a little bit in the cost issues, which is that at some point, as we try to electrify everything, we'll do all the cheap things and it'll become harder and harder and more and more expensive. And we'll actually want to keep some version of fossil fuel burning for those last ones that are hard to do. And I think Dan was touching on this in terms of uh, the opportunity cost of uh, flying airplanes and then and then doing uh, DAC af after that. And so that I really appreciate you guys structuring of that. Then there is the next obvious question, of course, that so we're going to put you on the uh, on the hot seat, which is, all right, if we have to do it, what's needed? And I would say that what's needed, I'd like there to be two flavors of this, and you can pick one and, and not the other, but there is a regulatory component of how are we going to actually guide society to get here. Dan made the point about uh, this being a collective action uh, problem. But of course, if you have technical solutions that you think are uh, ones that need to happen early... I'd very much like to hear about that. And that touches on the last part, which is time scale matters here. And so when you answer like what's needed, I'd appreciate understanding if you're talking about here's our new steady state economy that is fully decarbonized, or we need this at, when we're on the pathway to, to trying to get there because uh, the climate really doesn't actually care. It just uh, it, it cares just about how much CO2 is up there. And we could pick a bad system to go to, go to at steady state, um, and cook ourselves, or we could be headed towards a good system, but pick a bad way there and also cook ourselves. So I, any comments about actually how we're going to do it, regulatory or technical, coupled to time scale would be terrific. And uh, Julio, I don't know if that hand was left up uh, or if you are uh, wanting to jump in on, on your favorite one. It's hard to believe that you'd be willing to jump in, of course. <laughs> you are also just muted, though, Julio, Julio so... I am so shy and retiring, yes. Um, uh, let me start with your second point. There's always a way to do something wrong. Like, we're all throwing spaghetti on the wall here. We're trying stuff. We got to get rolling. And we learn as we go. And if we try regulation, it doesn't work. Let's fix the regulation. If we try a technology pathway, it's a dead end. Like, we can, we can try something else. Like, the, this is going to be part of the work. And we've done this. That's exactly what we saw with solar, with wind, with batteries, with LEDs, with all these things. Like we've tried things and then something worked and then we made progress. So uh, I, I, again, the thinking about the optimal end state, what we should do as opposed to what we can do. Uh, I think we're going to need a mix of all these things in different geographies and different places. With respect to tech, though, I want to go to two that Dan already mentioned that I think are under focused and are really good. One of them is biomass wrote a paper on biomass carbon removal and storage for the Japanese government a couple of years ago. Uh, our estimate was that there's sustainable biomass that would remove between two and a half and five and a half gigatons. That's a good number. No gigaton left behind. 
So if we can get a couple of gigatons out of biomass, that's great. Just quickly, Julio, are you talking about biomass that you're going to go bury or that you're going to burn? Uh, biomass carbon removal and storage. Maybe that is biohydrogen with CCS. Maybe that's power like they're doing in Denmark. Maybe that's combined heat and power like they're doing in Sweden. Maybe that's just bio oil injection like Charm is doing. Maybe that's just burying it. Whatever works, <laughs> like there's lots of ways to do this. Um, and uh, uh, a pay we are a, a, about to release, actually, we talked about it at Verge. You can go to a website and get it, but I don't have the link today on, on actually what are the principles of sustainable biomass harvesting. That's going to be the, the rub. We don't want to chop down ra rainforest in Indonesia to do this. Like we don't want to have palm oil plantations. We know that. So what's the right way to do it? And in fact, uh, Dan Sanchez at Berkeley and Bodhi Cabillo at Stanford have written that up. It's a terrific piece of work. It'll be available on our website shortly. Um, the other thing that I, I want to go to is what Dan was talking about the oceans. I've been a longtime fan of ocean alkalinity enhancement. And I think that's a lot of what, what he was thinking about. Jess, this is your bailiwick. You do a certain amount of that. Uh, if I were standing on Mars, thinking broadly, what's the cheapest, fastest way to solve all these problems? I would do a whole lot of ocean alkalinity enhancement. The key challenge right now is that's illegal. <laughs> the Ocean Convention prevents that. So you need to do, amend international law to really do that at scale. But in the meantime, why don't we learn some stuff? Thank you, Julio. You guys have abandoned the hand-raising part, but uh, I know that you haven't abandoned the eagerness to speak. So uh, uh, Emily or, or Jen, do either of you guys want to uh, jump in here? And then we'll go to you, Dan. Well, I'd just say real quickly that, you know, there are a lot of experiments going on about local um, lo local alkalinity enhancement, for example, by electrolysis of seawater um, to then shift the balance of CO2 in the oceans that is normally bicarbonate to carbonate, and then using that as a means to, to uh, combine with, um, with magnesium or calcium to make, uh, to mineralize the CO2. So those kinds of experiments, and there are, in fact, there are companies that are doing this and that are at the pilot scale at this point. And, um, you know, I think the, 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 the thing that is still, and I think there's a, actually a, a whole bunch of experiments that are going on uh, that the DOE is supporting um, related to local uh, experiments in the field. So I think we will learn a lot over the next few years about that. I think that there's a lot of resistance, as you can imagine, um, and I'm sure you know, to uh, large scale uh, interventions without doing the local due diligence. So I think that's what we have to do first. Thank you very much for that, Emily. I appreciate it. Um, uh, Dan, you wanted to say something and you, maybe you have an opinion about precipitating carbon from the ocean. I, I, I do, but I'll, I'll let Jennifer speak first and then and I'll go. Okay. All right, thanks, Dan. Um, yeah, so what Emily was saying too, I'll just I'll piggyback on that, and that DOE has has just made a bunch of announcements on some ocean projects, uh, really just over the last couple of weeks. And so ARPA-E has an SEAC CO2 uh, announcement that they made, and then also our office, Fossil Energy and Carbon Management with NOAA. Um, another group that's excited about this space. And it's not just about, it, it's all paths. It's, it's ocean alkalinity. Um, it's also biogenic uh, methods for carbon removal from the ocean, but it's also understanding um, sensing technologies, developing sensing technologies and the hardware coupled to the modeling um, of, of the regional impact that it has. And so a lot of exciting work happening in this space right now. Uh, but going back to the question um, that was asked and thinking about uh, the regulation piece, not so much the regulation, but when I think about the finance piece, I think we've got some amazing opportunities right now happening. The bit of voluntary markets that's taking place with carbon removal today that Dan mentioned, uh, we have the Inflation Reduction Act, $180 a ton for, for carbon removal, coupled to, for direct air capture. We've got the infrastructure law. Um, so we are de-risking a bit of that finance through that. I think personally, there's a lot of technologies out there to get excited about. And we're trying to actually fund industry where they're at, like from concept to front end engineering design to demonstrations if they're ready. Uh, but the one piece that I think that's going to 
really be a barrier is the social piece. Uh, it's that, and it's not just carbon removal, but it's just technology in general. And that we are asking communities oftentimes that have been overburdened um, by the fossil fuel industry. And when we think about geologic storage, which is coupled to bioenergy with the carbon capture or, or bikers, some of those approaches, also direct air capture, you need to have that offtake. You need to have that CO2 storage. Oftentimes it's in rocks that we're also good at producing oil and gas. And so one of the things that um, the Department of Energy is doing is community benefits plans and robust, at the end of the day, community benefits, community agreements. Um, and I really think in order for us to build these projects in a way that leads to the second and the third and the fourth is to do it in a way that it takes care of people. You know, And so if we can think about these investments and understand you know, what are the harms or what is the history or the legacy impacts of the community? What do they care about? Maybe it's air pollution. And if we're building these big systems to scrub CO2 out of the air, is there a way that we can design them to also reduce other pollutants, you know, to actually deliver a benefit, not just jobs. Everybody goes to jobs when they talk about benefits, but it's also just like the health of communities, pollution. And so this is a piece that I think we need to think really carefully about. I know our administration is, but the Inflation Reduction Act doesn't necessarily have these same guardrails in place that the bipartisan infrastructure law does. And so to me, these are these are the key pieces that are gonna need to have impact. Terrific, thank you so much for that. Um, I think the social political license to actually carry out any of these is going to be the most important public question that that we uh, that we go after, and I'm eager to have that as an open and honest conversation <laughs> out in, out in the public. Dan, you have uh, had a couple things I think you wanted to say. Yeah, I, I want to say something about about the ocean and something about biomass. Um, as far as the ocean, I think it's important for us to think about our interventions in the context of what the ocean is doing naturally. Um, Ocean carbon uptake, it's not really half of the CO2 we emit, it's more like a third. It's its um, combined, the land and the ocean take up about half of the CO2 we emit into the atmosphere and the ocean's about two thirds of that. The land is about a third right now, it used to be about 50-50, but it's moved a little bit more towards the ocean recently um, over the last decade or two. Um, that, we obviously don't want to do anything to enhance ocean uptake that is not additional, that actually just reduces the ocean's ability to take up a CO2 on its own, because that wouldn't actually help anything at the end of the day. And there are some ideas out there for ocean interventions that would actually interfere with the ocean's ability to take up carbon. But on long timescales, the ocean has incredible capability to take up carbon. Remember the ocean, you know, we're emitting today 40, 40 gigatons of CO2, which is about 11 gigatons of carbon, but um, but the ocean holds about 40,000 gigatons of carbon. It's a huge reservoir. And the uh, additional carbon we're putting in from fossil fuel is significant, but still really small to the ocean. Um, and the problem is time scale. The problem is the ocean doesn't mix fast enough. But you know, when we're talking about adding alkalinity to the ocean, we're talking about doing it in a way that doesn't decrease the ocean's ability to take up carbon, that it actually enhances it. And that's the whole point. So it doesn't interfere with the natural uptake of carbon. And I think that's really important. Emily, something that's really important is that um, uh, mineralization and carbon as calcite or some other carbon solid is the last thing you want. It's actually what you want to avoid because as long as you can keep it dissolved, you can store twice as much carbon as the ocean in the ocean. As soon as you precipitate calcium carbonate, you lose half the carbon. And so we really want to avoid anything that mineralizes carbon in general. Um, uh, so well, I was proposing that's, that's... it for for you for use, right? So if you want to use the minerals as aggregates, then you want to make the mineral. So that's right, but but about. unfortunately, well, then maybe it's a good thing that the scale of what we're talking about totally dwarfs the scale of the global building industry. So you can have your building materials, and it's not even you know five percent <laughs> of what I'm talking about. 
So it's fine. Um, but in general, I don't care whether you use the minerals or leave it in the ocean. When you mineralize, you release CO2. And that's really important to, to emphasize here. Dan is bringing um, up a, a very counterintuitive thing that he and I would love for this to turn into a marine chemistry uh, d- discussion. And nobody else who's through. joined here wouldn't appreciate that whatsoever. So, But I, it is one, one sort of takeaway that I use in my aquatic chemistry class is that if what you want to do is solve the CO2 problem, the worst thing you could do is grow coral reefs. Um, that yes, uh, that's coral exactly reefs right. precipitate calcium carbonate, and that takes away one unit of carbon, but also takes away two units of base. And so you uh, release CO2 when you precipitate, uh, uh, when you mineralize out of the ocean. And that is a and very fact, hard thing of- to follow. Uh, and and I, I appreciate that, 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 uh, it goes to chemistry classes um, that most of the public didn't enjoy their high school chemistry class, right? And so uh, uh, maybe we shouldn't go t- too deep down that. But I will say that precipitating calcium carbonate is probably something that we don't don't want to do straight out of the ocean. But Dan, well, you, you had two points you wanted to talk about biomass. Yeah, the, other, the other thing I wanted to say was just about biomass, which is that... Um, so, so there's a lot. There's been a lot of effort on um, n- what are called nature-based climate solutions or natural climate solutions, and this has been uh, monetized by groups like the Nature Conservancy and Conservation International to preserve forests and take up carbon. And this has um, uh, uh, become very problematic because there's such incentives for essentially cheating. Um, problems with additionality, problems with permanence, problems with leakage. We don't need to go down that road, although I'm going to just put in the chat the link to uh, John Oliver's HBO piece on carbon offsets, and you can watch it and uh, uh, see the damage that's been done in this space. One of the problems here, and this is where there's an opportunity, it's why I think Microsoft is paying a lot of money for direct air capture and not for, um, for forests, and it's because, um, in theory, direct air capture of CO2 is verifiable. It's much easier to monitor and verify that the CO2 has actually been removed. Whereas when you preserve trees, you have no idea for all sorts of reasons that I mentioned before. And I think that's really, really important here, that as we work on this, we think about that. And it's actually one of the challenges with ocean alkal- adding ocean alkalinity, ocean, adding base or alkalinity to the ocean, is the verification of exactly how much carbon you've removed. Um, I think when you're taking it and putting it underground, you know exactly what you're doing. It's a little bit harder when you're doing it in the ocean. Um, It's a little bit harder when you're scattering minerals that you say are gonna weather and remove CO2 on a field. Um, And I think we have to confront that straightforwardly and honestly, because the verification is absolutely critical. So Jess, I'm going to uh, suggest that in the view of time that we go to an audience question and then we'll ask the panelists to uh, offer a few final thoughts before we wrap up. Yeah, thanks so much, Harry. Um, there have been a lot of terrific questions that have appeared here that folks can see in the Q&A. There was an equal number, maybe even twice as many that we got even before uh, the panel started that I had a chance to, to go through. And I apologize to anybody that uh, your favorite question doesn't get an- asked. Um, but in taking the, the sum of both of those sets of questions, there really was a theme that rose to the top that had many of the people wondering about price. What What is this going to cost us? Uh, the second most popular theme in the questions was one about permanence that we just touched on. But people are quite worried about uh, paying for something that isn't actually going to last. And so I'd like the panelists to weigh in on what do you guys think about $100 a ton as this number that is sort of out there as uh, the CO2 uh, benchmarking one? And um, how do you think about uh, permanence? Go ahead, Julio. Yeah. Well, of course, this is like our company's day job. Like we think about these things an awful lot. Between you, me, and the fence post, I think $100 is just easy like messaging, that's not actually the piece that the price that matters. The price that matters is a lot closer to $200 a ton. $200 a ton is the point at which even the best sustainable aviation fuel starts to do actual abatement. $200 a ton is about the point at which the very best looking green hydrogen starts to to, to work in some of these arenas. Um, $200 a ton is uh, uh, where we saw the low carbon fuel standard not that long ago. 
uh, and people in California were okay with it. Like, like this is, a, a, I think, a more useful number. Already, a lot of the solutions that we see out there are cheaper than that. Uh, the best nature-based stuff, the really high-quality nature-based stuff is between $30 and $50 a ton. To be clear, it's not five. If you're buying an offset for $5 a ton, it costs more than $5 to emit CO2. <laughs> like it doesn't like we're not going to remove it for less than that but but something like 30 to 50 for the best nature based stuff for things like biochar it's maybe more like 100 to 200 dollars a ton for biomass with carbon capture it's more like 200 to 300 dollars a ton but coming down direct air capture is north of 400 dollars but coming down so there's lots of pathways that are going to get in here and 200 dollars a ton is the point at which all the cheap stuff gets taken up at $200 a ton, like you've done all the easy stuff and then you're stuck with the really hard stuff. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that's a good number to keep in the back of your head. Julio, I'm going to jump in because it was obvious from Jen's uh, facial expressions that she was uh, had a couple of opinions about uh, uh, the price here. So please, Jen, jump uh -oh. in. Uh-oh, I didn't know I was so transparent there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, the only thing that, I mean, I'm thinking about here is just what we're doing you know, what we're doing at DOE. And I feel like, you know, when you look at the cost, it's a lot of paper studies, you know, uh, we've got Climeworks, you know, that publicly uh, reports $600 a ton, right, for, for you know, looking at the Orca plant in Iceland. Um, but we really need to get these projects demonstrated. We need to have transparency. Um, I'm excited about what's to come. You know, we've got uh, $1.2 billion that we just announced in September for two direct air capture hubs. Uh, we also have $100 million that we've invested across the entire portfolio, uh, 20 different projects all across the United States at different technological readiness levels. And so just excited to kind of see what comes out in terms of um, the durability um, we really need to make sure that there is a framework, that there is measurement, monitoring, reporting and verification for things that aren't like direct air capture. We actually have a, you know, class six wells with EPA and 45Q and IRS. Um, we don't have those types of incentives or support structure uh, for improved forest management or increased carbon storage in soils. And so yeah. we are investing in the national labs and leveraging our national labs to be able to help to develop the framework. And we made those announcements this summer. And so really just excited by the work we're doing to hopefully figure out truly um, what these costs are and whether or not we can do it in a durable way. Yeah, I really appreciate you linking cost to durability because they, they go hand in hand. Uh, and you were touching on that, Julio, with the, you know, the 30 to $50 a ton for the nature-based ones. But maybe they're not as durable in some cases as uh, some of the other ones out there. Anybody else want to ask anything about cost? And keep in mind, this will cut into your time for your final thoughts that we uh, let, told everybody you'd be able to have. I think one of the things about cost is that it, people ask it first all the time. And yet it's one of the hardest things for us to say anything about, given the nascent state of all of this. Uh, Dan, you wanted to, to, to I, say I I think it's really important to distinguish the costs at which we're willing to subsidize early movers, where we distribute that cost widely so that it actually costs us very little, versus the cost of sustained at scale um, uh, service of some sort, carbon removal. This problem um, is both the transient and the new city state that we're trying to get to. And I think it's a great thing. It's to wonderful. That, you know, Jen, you've just described a whole bunch of stuff that DOE is doing that's awesome. And throw, throwing some money at that, given that we're spending $2.7 trillion a year on energy systems for the world, spending a few billion or maybe tens of billions on direct air capture seems like a drop in the bucket, actually, given that we think we're going to need it down the road. But... Um, uh, whether the public will tolerate two or three hundred dollars a ton cost in the future is an open question, and I think we don't know yet. Okay, I'm gonna ask these guys a chance to sum up. Maybe we should give them each a minute while we have five minutes yeah, left. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I wanted to actually ask each uh, of our uh, panelists. First of all, I want to thank them for the really. Uh, vibrant and engaging conversation that we've had here around this really important subject and really found a, a, a way a, 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 a way to think about this issue that I think uh, many 
may not have had before they came here to, and that's a fantastic outcome. Uh, so I wanted to just ask somewhat provocatively uh, in, uh, as you uh, formulate your closing remarks, uh, we're, we're just barely over the starting line in this field of carbon removal and strategies and technology and policy and so forth. Just, just barely past the, the starting gun. Can you see your way to a future where we actually begin to make a significant dent, not only in a, uh, offsetting emissions uh, uh, in uh, the uh, current energy landscape, but really making a serious dent in historical emissions? In other words, uh, enabling the Microsoft uh, mandate across the entire uh, you know, gl global economy, re remitting uh, CO2 cumulative emissions all the way back to the starting line in uh, uh, 1780 or so. So given the interest of time, uh, I'll just jump in and uh, I wanna say that um, I can't help but rebut the, the ocean chemistry that you just mentioned, because I just wanna say that no one is talking about making coral reefs from the existing ocean. What we're talking about is actually bringing the alkalinity into the ocean, just like you're talking about, but on a local scale um, to be able to make uh, mineral, minerals that one could use as aggregates. So when you said, Harry, about thinking about the future, I think we have to think in terms of not just the materials we make today, but also what we will make tomorrow. And yes, they may come from biomass. They may come from, from uh, recycled plastics. They may come from CO2. In certain cases, they may come from coal waste. That's another thing that we are, um, we are looking at. What could those be that could contribute to, to CDR, to carbon, di carbon removal? I think not just carbonates, but the other way in terms of making solid carbon and using solid carbon, which would be durable for building materials for, you know, it's already carbon carbon composites are used as the fuselage of Boeing 787s. So in for transportation, for lightweight transportation, for all sorts of, um, of building applications that they're not being used for now. They, it's very early days, okay? But down the road, I can see that we can have a dual win of carbon removal and solid carbon products that the world needs. And it won't be on the scale that is needed for CCS, but we should also recognize what Jen said about uh, the need to make the, the case to communities. And we should look as a cautionary tale what has happened in the EU. In the EU, there is no CCS on land that's being allowed. It's all offshore. How are we going to do something different that's going to make it so that we can actually do the CCS at scale? We may have to find other ways that will include carbon utilization as part of that solution. Okay, great. Uh, a couple of sentences closing from uh, uh, Jen and then Dan and then Julio. Thanks, Harry. <clears throat> I would just say, you know, I think there are probably a lot of students in the audience, students in the audience today, and uh, and just really want to encourage those that are kind of entering the field um, to not uh, do the R and D and the technology in a vacuum. We're pretty good at de-risking technology. We are not so good at thinking about the social side of things, and so engage with social scientists bring them along on the journey and, and maybe they can actually help us researchers figure this out. Dan. So I just want to come back to something Jen said, which was about opportunity and uh, thinking about equity. We often think about that domestically in terms of underserved communities who are affected by this energy transition, but there's also a global inequality problem. We have to remember that 30% of emissions, 29% of cumulative emissions have come from the US. If we take out South Africa and put all the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa together, they account for less than 1%. That's the nature of the fundamental inequality of climate change. And as we think about all of these things, we have to remember 
our goal is not to get the U.S. to net zero. Our goal is not to get the U.S. to net negative. Our goal is to help the U.S. lead the world to get to net zero because the only number the climate system cares about is global emissions. And that doesn't mean we just do it at whatever cost we're willing to pay. We have to do it in a way that ultimately looks attractive to everybody else in the world. And that's much, much harder. And I think we just have to remember that it's the global picture, and that includes confronting some of the global inequalities that have existed in the past. Okay, Stop great. That. So Julio. Really two sentiments super fast. First of all, Harry, to your question, yeah, we're going to get there. I'm confident. It's what one of the things that CO2 removal is for. One of the things it's for is for restoring climate. So if we can get it up to the scale where we're doing the residual emissions that matter, then we can think about what's the moral and appropriate follow-on cycle. I look forward to that discussion. Second, I want everybody in the audience here to think about what they really don't know. We've got to be humble about what we're getting into here. We don't really know what people will pay. We don't really know what governments will pay. We don't really know what these things cost. We don't really know what the public will accept or not. The only way to solve these problems is to get into it. I look forward to discovering these things as we deploy more and more and learn more and more. Okay, great. I wanna thank all of the panelists here on behalf of Caltech and Nostera uh, for a vibrant discussion. Stay tuned for future communications from Caltech and Nostera on carbon removal and other things related to the Catalyst series of uh, uh, presentations around uh, energy and climate. So thanks uh, and uh, we'll, uh, I uh, look forward to carrying the dialogue into the future.